Good morning, members of the jury. Happy Friday. We have, uh, you heard yesterday that the defendant has rested his case, uh, and at this point, uh, Mr. Maybanks or Mr. Harris, uh, does the state wish to present any rebuttal evidence? Yes, Your Honor. The state calls Paul Bush. Okay. You're headed right across over here to the chair with the red seat. Before you take that witness chair, please pause and raise your right hand. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Okay, go ahead and be seated. There are just a couple of expectations in the courtroom, Mr. Bush. I'll just remind you. Uh, it's important that you allow the attorneys to finish a question, even if you have an idea where the question is headed. Please let them finish so that the idea is that only one voice speaks at a time. Uh, I will ask them to give you the same courtesy of waiting until you have finished your answer before they ask the next question. Also be aware of that microphone. We have that there so that we can hear you. Uh, and please tell us your full name and spell your first and last names. My name is Paul J. Bush, spelled P-A-U-L. Bush, B-U-S-H. Thank you. You may conduct your examination, Mr. Maybanks. <coughs> Thank you, Your Honor. Paul, uh, what is your current occupation? My current occupation is a criminalist supervisor with the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation in the State Crime Laboratory. I want to ask you a little bit about your background. First of all, can you tell us your educational background? My formal okay. education consists of a Bachelor of Science degree <coughs> with Made double majors in chemistry and biology from Morningside College in Sioux City. With that, I also possess a secondary education teaching certificate and coaching endorsements. I also possess a Master of Arts degree in biology from Drake University. That master's degree was a thesis-based program. <coughs> now, I want to ask you a little bit about your um, the background, the, uh, your employment background. How long have you been with the DCI Crime Laboratory? I've been with the DCI almost 38 years. And you told us uh, just a bit ago that your position was criminalist supervisor, is that right? That's correct. Can you tell us uh, about that position and what your current duties are? Uh, as far as that position is concerned, I've been the criminalist supervisor for almost 10 years. Uh, that position involves the overseeing of 20 uh, DNA members or staff members in that section, which includes 16 DNA criminalists and four forensic science technicians. What other positions have you held with the DCI Criminalistics Laboratory? Prior to that 10 years, I was spent a previous 10 years as the DNA technical leader of the uh, DNA section of the laboratory. And what is uh, that involved? That technical leader position is a position that oversees the actual day-to-day uh, -day operations of the DNA testing. So you must monitor all the different procedures and policies that are in place when doing DNA testing. And if there are any uh, problems or situations, the DNA technical leader's responsibility is to resolve them. Does that encompass, um, I guess, what some of us would understand as a quality control type of uh, position? Yes, that is a, a major function of that DNA, DNA technical leader's position is to monitor or um, see that the quality control measures are in place. So you're currently the criminalist supervisor and previous to that you were the DNA technical leader. Uh, what other positions have you held with the DCI Criminalistics Laboratory over that 38 years? During that, those 38 years, I also served as a crime scene analyst in the laboratory for at least 25 years. I did what was called crime scene investigations around the state. Can you tell us what that involved? Our, our crime scene investigation in the crime laboratory involves the uh, analysis uh, and collection of physical evidence at crime scenes. Typically, uh, for the DCI to be involved, we have to be invited by a local law enforcement agency to assist them 
typically with a death, death investigation. And again, typically we don't do, say, Davenport or Waterloo or Sioux City, the large uh, law enforcement agencies. We usually help the smaller law enforcement agencies that would not have the staff and the expertise to perform those types of analyses. So when you are, would be at a crime scene, you would be collecting physical evidence uh, in the case, documenting that uh, crime scene through photographs, sketches, and then uh, collecting any types of physical evidence that you deem necessary to help solve that crime. I take you back in time to 1982 and when you first came to the uh, DCI laboratory. Um, tell us if you would um, kind of how the um, use of um, DNA developed and you know, maybe what preceded that. Uh, again, uh, DNA really did not come into play in the uh, Iowa DCI crime lab till the mid-1990s. In the 80s, what we did was con called conventional serology. And what we were doing at that time was trying to identify stains using what would be known as the ABO typing system. That was one of the major ones. So you can be, most of you know about your ABO type, type A, type B, type AB, or type O. And we would attempt to type uh, individual blood stains based on uh, their ABO type. And then uh, you said that uh, DNA came into play in the mid-90s, is that right? That's correct. Uh, research was going on in the late 80s, early 90s. That was actually my thesis program, was uh, developing some procedures in that uh, arena. But again, our crime laboratory did not come online till the mid-90s. And what kind of DNA uh, forensic analysis did the crime laboratory start performing in the mid-90s? In the mid-90s, we were doing techniques called the HLA DQ Alpha polymarker and D1SAD uh, DNA tests. That was a lot of words there. What, what is, I mean, can you describe for us in a nutshell what that encompassed? Uh, when we first started out, we were doing a procedure, again, that is different than what we are doing today, but it was the technology that was available at the time. It was using a, a what was called a PCR or polymerase chain reaction-based technology, which actually was really the, uh, I'd say the breakthrough in uh, DNA molecular biology in that you theoretically can start with a single copy of DNA and can make additional copies. So you would start out with one, uh, go through this thermal cycle, it's just like a photocopier. So you go one to two to four to eight to 16. And by the time you have run that through 30 cycles, you've got between a million and a billion times more DNA than you started with. So that was the start of that technology. Uh, we used at that time this polymarker system or DQ alpha system where uh, had DNA actually uh, probes and things that were actually on little strips of nylon paper and then you actually put the extracted DNA on those strips. Uh, very rudimentary, but that's what we started out with back in the mid 90s. And then we've heard in this case that uh, that technology substantially improved even by the uh, early 2000s when the evidence was tested in this case. Yes, that's correct. So, Paul, can you uh, give us an idea of what kind of specialized training, just some highlights of what kind of specialized training you received in DNA forensic analysis then that led through those developments and whatnot? I've had numerous courses uh, around the country, uh, many from the FBI Academy in Quantico, Virginia, on DNA analysis methods, quality control methods, uh, auditing tech, uh, procedures for DNA. Uh, I've had coursework from uh, what was called CETUS Corporation out in Emeryville, California on DNA analysis. I've been to dozens of workshops and uh, presentations on DNA analysis throughout the country through uh, either the American Academy of Forensic Scientists, the Midwest Association of Forensic Scientists, and then, uh, again, specialized courses that I've taken throughout the country over the last, again, 30 plus years. What kind of uh, certifications, if any, do you have in the area of DNA forensics? I am currently a diplomat with the American Board of Criminalistics. Uh, this is a national accrediting or certification organization that accredits uh, people in different areas of forensic science. And are you proficiency tested? Yes, I am also proficiency tested twice per year in the areas of forensic DNA analysis and uh, what we would call database DNA analysis. 
What kind of uh, specialized training have you had in the area of crime scene investigation? As far as crime scene investigation, um, I had coursework through the Iowa Law Enforcement Academy uh, out in Johnston, Iowa on crime scene investigation. I worked many years with a senior member of the staff who had uh, dozens of years of experience as a crime scene investigator. They were actually special agents. And then uh, just my knowledge and expertise that I learned throughout the laboratory in doing, at that time, serological testing and DNA testing. Paul, um, would you be able to give us an estimate of approximately how many crime scenes uh, you have personally worked on or in in the past 25 years? Uh, as far as crime scenes, I would guess I did in excess of 200 crime scenes uh, cases during my uh, tenure. Have you qualified as an expert in crime scene investigation uh, in court? Yes. In through that uh, experience and that training, did you also receive uh, training and experience in the proper care, uh, handling, and collection of items of evidence uh, at crime scenes to submit to the laboratory? Yes. What kind of uh, training did you receive in that area? So that training, again, involves uh, collection and preservation of evidence. Packaging is obviously very important. Um, in collecting crime scene evidence that you don't either cross-contaminate items or allow external uh, evidence or external uh, materials to come in contact with your crime scene pieces. So packaging is very important so you don't allow, again, transfer from material outside the crime scene onto that evidence or between items of evidence. In your career, how many cases do you believe that you um, have worked with that included the examination of items of evidence for the presence of DNA? Uh, I would guess approximately 900 cases that I would have tested over uh, my career for DNA analysis. And um, do you also conduct review of your, uh, well, through the course of your career, of your peers and now the uh, persons that you supervise in their work? Yes, I also perform technical reviews of, uh, actually I have uh, thousands of cases over my career. Uh, one of the requirements of DNA testing and reports is that every DNA report be technically reviewed by another qualified DNA analyst. So that is again one of my other additional duties as supervisor. And throughout your career, have you performed uh, DNA analysis in a variety of criminal investigations? Yes. Uh, are the analysis methods that uh, have been used over the course of time with the DCI Criminalistics Laboratory and the ones currently used uh, generally accepted and used by other forensic uh, DNA laboratories across the nation? Yes. And have you testified before as an expert in forensic DNA analysis? Yes. Can you go over uh, with us the current uh, certifications that the Iowa DCI lab has? Currently, our laboratory is accredited through uh, what's called ANAB, and I gotta get that acronym, what that stands for. <clears throat> Which is uh, the American National Standards Institute National Accreditation Board. So one of the things about uh, any forensic laboratory is that uh, uh, today you should be, or actually for a, a state crime laboratory like us, you have to be nationally accredited by an accrediting agency if you are going to uh, maintain DNA samples and upload DNA samples to what's called the CODIS database. So they require that our laboratory be accredited and follow national uh, accreditation standards. Okay. May I approach the witness, Your Honor? You may. Be handing the witness what's being marked as state's exhibit uh, CV5. Paul, can you tell us what that is? Yes, this is a called a statement of qualifications document that I have to maintain in the laboratory that has all my uh, education and uh, 
I want to say my all my experience and training that I have had throughout my career was at ECI Crime Laboratory. It's basically a, like a scientific resume. And does that contain a fair and accurate and current uh, update and rundown of your uh, qualifications to testify as an expert, both in DNA analysis and in crime scene investigations? Yes. Move to interstate CV5, Your Honor. Without objection. CV5 will be received and made part of the record. And where on this uh, uh, CV, Paul, would we be able to find um, uh, reference to some of the uh, various trainings uh, that you've had in DNA forensic analysis and crime scene investigation? So after you go past the first half of the first page, there are one. There are four pages listing kind of chronologically of all the courses uh, specific, specific to forensic science that I have taken over the years. Does the um, statement of qualifications there in CV5 also have a rundown of uh, various courses or trains you've had in crime scene investigation? Yes, it should have it included also. Paul, um, have you had an opportunity to review the entire case file of DCI number 85-6117, a homicide uh, that was investigated by the Cedar Rapids Police Department in which uh, the victim was Michelle Martinko? Yes. I want to ask you some questions about uh, some of the testimony that was received yesterday by a Dr. Spence. Um, yesterday we heard about the uh, scientific theory of secondary transfer of DNA and what uh, Dr. Spence referred to as the realm of possibilities for secondary uh, transfer to occur. As a career uh, criminalist, uh, having spent your entire career working in um, some capacity for our, the, our state laboratory, from a scientific standpoint, uh, to come to any conclusion as to whether secondary transfer took place, what do you need to know? Typically, in order to uh, make that assessment, uh, you typically need a scenario as to what happened or what took place. So uh, if I don't have a scenario like, you know, someone was stabbed or someone was shot or, and, and where it happened and uh, the circumstances surrounding the, surrounding the case, it would be very difficult to uh, come up with possibilities for secondary transfer. Uh, it, it could be, you know, anything. So typically what I would want to do if I'm going to make that attempt to determine if secondary transfer could have taken place is I would typically want a scenario as to if we said this, this, and this happened, where could you have possible secondary transfer? Otherwise, it, it could be anything. Would that scenario also need to include... Um what factors uh, were present that would allow uh, transfer to take place? Yes, that's correct. We heard about um, in court yesterday, Dr. Spence um, acknowledged in an article that he used to prepare for his testimony that there are um, numerous uh, factors that could contribute to the manner in which DNA could be transferred that um, are important. Is that, is that uh, your understanding of the literature too? Yes, that's correct. And otherwise, if you don't have that stuff, or you would, would you really be put in a position as a scientist to just make a guess? Yeah, otherwise, yes, yeah, you would just be guessing as to the uh, possibilities of secondary transfer. And so we uh, try and use, you know, factual information or scientific logic when uh, attempting to make these determinations. And if I don't have any scientific information to draw a conclusion, it becomes very difficult. In your experience and according to your uh, expertise, Paul, with the, all the cases you've worked on over the years, how common is it in uh, what's reported to you as a stabbing in incident where the victim sustained multiple stab wounds and there was evidence of a struggle that the assailant also sustains an injury that leads to active bleeding? I would say it is not uncommon for a suspect in a stabbing case to actually injure or cut themselves um, if the victim is fighting back. It's, uh, again, not uncommon for that to happen. We many times will detect 
the suspect or assailant's DNA, say, on the handle of the weapon. In, um, in the situations in which you've worked, do you also detect, um, are the situations where you also detect the suspect's DNA on um, other areas of the crime scene, uh, including the um, area where the, crime, where the crime took place or the victim's clothing? Uh, again, that can also happen, again, if there's a struggle and uh, there, there is a struggle taking place between victim and suspect. If the suspect injures themselves, there can be that transfer of suspect's DNA uh, onto the victim's clothing or to the crime scene. Paul, based upon the findings um, in this case that you familiarized yourself with in your uh, vast experience with uh, our crime lab, what is your opinion as the most scientifically supported theory as to how the blood of Jerry Burns ended up on this dress? I, uh, excuse me. I object to that question. That uh, foundation is inaccurate. There's been no testimony that the blood of Jerry Burns is found anywhere at this crime scene. So the hypothesis the, for the foundation of this question is inaccurate. It's uh, uh, false, and I object on the foundation grounds, and it's additionally calling for an opinion and conclusion that's not properly the subject of an expert opinion testimony in this case. Additionally, it's prohibited by Rule 5.403. Response to the objection, Mr. Maybanks. I beg to differ, Your Honor. There is um, ample and overwhelming evidence, given the state's uh, presentation of testimony in this case, that Jerry Burns' blood was at the crime scene on uh, Michelle Martinko's dress. We dispute that, obviously. In lieu of the testimony that was elicited by the defense yesterday as to uh, directly, I believe uh, Dr. Spence was asked if it was his opinion that um, uh, Jerry Burns' DNA or suspect DNA uh, that was located was on Michelle's dress from a cutting incident. He offered the opinion that he didn't believe that was possible um, and uh, offered his reasons thereof. This is a, a proper area of expert testimony, a very proper area of te expert testimony. Um, because it's directed at uh, what would be a scientifically supported theory based upon this witness's review of the file and um, the rules of evidence. Um, I think it's uh, in 5.700. I don't have the exact one now, but allows an expert to testify to an ultimate issue if foundations laid. Five point seven zero four. Thank Council. you. Uh, further argument, Mr. Spees. Uh, Your Honor, I, I can respond in detail about this. The testimony in this case has been from Linda Sawyer uh, that she could not say that the source of the uh, spotted F five came from blood. The same testimony came from Mike Schmidt, a criminalist from the Iowa Division of Criminal Investigation, who was under the supervision of this witness. Dr. Spence said that the DNA profile based on the extraction made by Linda Sawyer was not sufficient to say that it was blood. So <clears throat> to have this witness characterize it as blood or the prosecution to characterize it as blood is, is highly prejudicial. Further uh, argument, Mr. Maybanks? Your Honor, just to state that that certainly is the defense's uh, take on the evidence and what they were able to garner in terms of uh, a concession by the witnesses, but no witness here has uh, said that uh, based on the screening test indicated for the presence of blood and their DNA analysis that that wasn't Jerry Burns' blood. In fact, all the evidence points to that. Mr. Maybanks, I'm going to ask you to rephrase the hypothetical, uh, framing it in terms of, of Mr. Burns, or a profile that's consistent with Mr. Burns' DNA. Okay. Your Honor, oh. may I have a ruling on my objection, please? The specific ruling as to whether this is an appropriate uh, subject matter for uh, Mr. Bush to testify, to give an opinion? I objected on foundation grounds. I objected on another proper subject of opinion testimony and because it mischaracterized the evidence. 
Okay. I, I, I have to insist on a ruling on the, moat, on the objection, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, based upon the questions put to uh, Mr. Bush, the fact that he has uh, reviewed the case file uh, and given the work that he has done as a DNA or a, in DNA analysis as well as a supervising uh, criminalist at the DCI, uh, I find that there has been a proper foundation in terms of the uh, items that he has re reviewed in formulating an opinion uh, with regard to the subject matter, uh, given the testimony that members of the jury uh, that we all heard yesterday uh, from Dr. Spence in terms of a uh, secondary transfer uh, as being an explanation for DNA f material found at the F5 uh, location on State's Exhibit 7A, uh, or on the dress if I don't have the exact uh, exhibit number, um, that the subject matter is appropriate. Uh, and I, I apologize, the third ground, Mr. Spees. Foundation subject matter. Yeah, and, and I said it mischaracterized the evidence in this case, uh, characterizing what was found on F5 as the blood of Jerry Burns, and that was precisely how the question was phrased to the witness. And I have asked uh, Mr. Maybanks to, to rephrase that hypothetical um, using the, the terminology that has been used throughout the trial by the various experts um, in terms of a DNA profile um, that is consistent with and can. That, that cannot uh, exclude Mr. Burns as a contributor uh, rather than characterizing it as uh, Mr. Burns' blood. Is that inadequate? Do you feel that that's an adequate well, ruling? Well, am, am I taking it, Your Honor, then, that you're overruling my objection? Correct. Yes. Then I'd like to be heard outside the presence of the jury, please. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to uh, be in recess. Uh, I, I can't tell you, I can't think it's going to be more than 20 minutes, uh, but um, we will be in recess. Please bear in mind that admonition.